Hello, everyone. So um, today I will talk about a few different things that we do in my lab, but the title of the talk is High Density Neuro uh, Neurochemical Sensors. Uh, my name is Brian Kim. I'm an assistant professor of electrical and computer engineering. Uh, I have two primary research uh, areas. One, in, one is high density neurochemical sensor. The other one is point of care medical diagnostics, uh, which has been highly relevant recently. Uh, my primary teaching is electronics one, device electronics for integrated circuits and advanced bioelectronic systems. Uh, some of the recent fundings that we've had uh, include NIH and NSF. So uh, the format of my talk is going to be, I'll talk about the two research topics that we have. Uh, I'll give you an overview and I'll discuss briefly what my future directions are and um, that's where I would end. Okay, so the first topic is the uh, high density neurochemical sensors. We are developing high density neurochemical sensors mainly for two applications. Uh, the first one is to study the biophysics of uh, synaptic transmission more specifically to determine the fundamental mechanism of chemical secretion, as well as the pharmacological uh, modification that can happen to this process called exocytosis. Uh, the second application that we have in mind is uh, to develop a new modality for a uh, neural interface, as you are aware of. The most uh, common modality for neural neuro interface is voltage measurement but we believe that uh, neurochemical interface could be a really powerful instrument. And of course, the application is brain machine interface to uh, help people with neuroprosthetics, uh, including visual and uh, motor functions. So um, to achieve a uh, high density neurochemical sensors, um, the, the device that we develop is called uh, integrated silicon microelectrode array. Um, and the conceptual sort of um, mechanism or the way it operates is uh, shown on the left side. Um, so the device that we develop is actually based on CMOS chip, which is basically the technology that people use to develop computer chips. Um, and what we do is we develop a uh, unchip electrode directly above the computer chip, CMOS chip. And um, you would, we would culture the cells on top of it and these cells uh, are known to release neurotransmitter, right? So when you have neurons or neuronal-like cells, such as PC12 cells, sci-fi cells, and whatnot, they, they uh, secrete neurotransmitter when they're excited. And um, we have learned, of course, uh, with all the other people that we collaborate, that we can directly measure them using electrochemistry, uh, using an electrode. Uh, and the signal that is accumulated through these uh, interfaces are going directly into the integrated electronics where we can amplify and measure. Uh, the device that we typically develop looks something like this on the left bottom side, where we have the CMOS chip. CMOS chips are usually very small. They're about five millimeter by five millimeter. And they're located right in the middle here, which is then packaged using uh, 3D printed wells as well as PCB. Uh, but if you focus and look at the middle of the CMOS chip, you can see something like this on the middle. Uh, and what you see here is the surface of the CMOS chip, which has an on-chip electrode. And in the middle, we have 32 by 32 microelectrode array. And then underneath it, you have the integrated circuits that does the signal amplification, multiplexing, and all the processings. So if we zoom into a small section, you'll see the left, uh, the right picture, where you have an array of uh, sort of a bright box, which is a platinum electrode. Uh, and if we zoom in further, you see a small circular sort of shape. And what that indicates is the surface of this entire chip is actually covered with silicon dioxide for insulation, but we can open up this small circle, which is about the size of the cell for an electrode to be exposed. That's where we actually culture the cell and measure them. Uh, so this is a example of us using the device for neurochemical imaging. Um, so on the left side, you have the device again, but then it's coated with all these small particles and those are actually single cells. Uh, more specifically, PC12 cells that's uh, known to release um, norepinephrine and epinephrine type of neurotransmitters. So we grow them directly. And once we do that, um, we, can, we can monitor it. And on the right side, you can see that you see sort of these uh, bubble kind of shaped circles and also here as well. And those are the cells that we have cultured. So some of them are directly above the electrode and those are the ones that we would be able to measure the, the neurotransmitter secretions. 
Um, so the application of this, as I said, is to sort of study the biophysics or even the pharmacolo pharmacological modifications of certain drugs. So this page shows a recent work that we've done to use this as a, a drug screening tool. Um, so first of all, when you code it with a PC12 cells, all these individual electrodes are measuring it. And of course, because you have dedicated amplifier per each electrode, all these 1,020 electrodes are measuring in parallel. Um, so this shows some representative uh, traces of each electrode. We can't show all 1,024 because there are too many to fit in a single screen. But it's really nice to see these measurements because you can see that these individual spikes represents a quantal secretion. So when we learned synaptic transmission, th these are mediated by a process called exocytosis, which is quantal release event. So you have uh, a vesicle that release is a pocket of neurotransmitter and it's, it's quantal level. It's not continuous, but there's a level of secretion that you can achieve. And you can see a single vesicle release from these uh, individual spikes. So we can uh, heavily quantify the kinetics of individual release from single vesicle level. Um, so what we've done with this device is to treat a group of cells using a popular Parkinson's disease therapy called L-DOPA. And we've monitored the effect of L-DOPA by comparing the, the same measurement from a control cell. So you see on the left side, this is the, the, the control cell, which has a moderate level of exocytosis events. But on the right, on the right type, you see that they're the, first of all, the spikes are much bigger. And secondly, they have a lot more too. So we can do uh, quantifications and statistical uh, analysis to it to reveal that um, individual pocket, meaning the vesicle size actually have increased because of L-DOPA treatment. So this method is really powerful because it allows us to uh, identify and characterize the therapy on molecular level in minutes. And this uh, method took months to years with traditional methods in the past. Um, the second topic that we have is point of care medical, medical diagnostic. Um, and this is highly relevant because nowadays because of COVID-19. Um, so real-time PCR is a, a diagnostic method or chemical biochemical assay, which is really the best diagnostic method for many infectious diseases, including COVID-19, according to CDC. And also it's really useful for HIV, uh, malaria, TB, you name it. This is highly sensitive and highly specific. Um, and right now, if you go to a lab, uh, a COVID-19 testing lab, uh, more likely enough, th this is the method that we'll use. The problem with this method is that it's very costly and the process is very complex. So when you look at recent work on people creating point of care diagnostic methods, they typically don't consider real-time PCR as a candidate. So they usually uh, put their focus on creating new modalities, something new, right? Uh, but our goal here is to, rather than designing a new biochemical assay, to take the, the powerful real-time PCR and make it cost-effective, make it really simple so that people can actually use them. Uh, so this shows a conceptual drawing of a, a simple sort of a handheld device where you can kind of spit into it and then you put it into our real-time PCR device that's completely portable and it will tell you the results in minutes. So in order to reduce the cost of real-time PCR, we've been really working hard on open source type of platform. So essentially what we've been doing is we've been taking this conventional PCR machine, real-time PCR machine that cost around $30,000 to $60,000 and uh, redesign it based on either off-the-shelf components or um, really simple design component, use, um, perhaps 3D printed parts, right? Where you can just download the file and just uh, print it with your 3D printers. So this is a uh, design that we have come up with about three years ago. We are, we've been making many different modifications to this because we collaborate with outsiders who tries to build this on their own. And we've been trying to help them to see if that will work. And if there are certain parts that they have some challenges, we've been modifying the design so that it can really be uh, an open source type of platform. Um, and we've actually built this, this size is, uh, it fits within the palm of your hand. So it's really small. 
um, and you can perform the real-time PCR just like the normal conventional high-quality PCR device. So we've actually applied this to many different kinds of infectious disease, including COVID, uh, SARS-CoV-2, COVID-19, of course, and we were able to see them just like how people see it. We were able to test it with TB, with, um, with collaboration with Kyle Rohde. Uh, we've also tried Zika virus. We've also tried Candidaris with collaboration with New York, New York State Department of Health. Um, so it's been uh, quite successful. Some of the future direction of my lab currently is we've been really interested in taking the neurochemical, high density neurochemical sensors that we've been developing for in vivo applications. And the reason is because um, if you look at sort of the typical conventional modality of neuro interfaces, they're measuring voltage. Uh, ECOG measurements are voltage, EEG is felt voltage, penetrating lectures are voltage as well. The common problem involved with voltage measurement is that they're prone to crosstalk. So one example is if you have an EEG sensor, you can have hundreds of electrodes and it might be helpful to gain some spatial information. But from that point on, if you scale up to a million electrodes, it doesn't help because at that point, you're actually measuring the same thing. All the electrodes that's located in the same spot, they're essentially measuring the same thing. So we think that if we develop this neurochemical imaging tech technique with some kind of computation involved, which creates super resolution neurochemical imaging method, you could really overcome some of the issues the co common modality has and uh, provide much higher spatial resolution, not single cell, but beyond that, single vesicle level. Um, so with that, I'll conclude my presentation here. I thank you for your attention.